Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, welcome to Daily Quran Reflections with uh, Dr. Aslam Abdullah. My name is uh, Muhammad Abdullah Aleem. On behalf of Islamic City, we're happy that you're here with us uh, today. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Aslam Abdullah who will be covering the 14th juz. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Aslam. Wa alaikum assalam. Today we are on the 14th juz of the Quran and it comprises uh, Surah Al-Hijr and Surah Al-Nahal which is the 15th and 16th chapter of the Quran uh, only 28 uh, ayahs of Surah Al-Nahal are part of this juz and the entire Surah Al-Hijr Hijr refers to the valley uh, where the people of S Samud used to live. It is in northwestern Arabia. And this is where they built a housing carving the mountains. So it is in reference to <clears throat> their technology, in reference to their progress, in reference to their denial of the uh, message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The main theme of this particular surah is that the divine guidance comes to all people all time. And people have the choice to either accept it or to reject it. And Allah clearly tells that those who reject his faith would face the consequences of their rejection in this life as well as in the life hereafter as well. It also uh, gives the story of Prophet Lut والسلام, and the other groups who were in that area or locality. Surah Al-Nahl talks about the Allah's creation and Allah's creative powers. And clearly demonstrates that everything that exists in this universe points to the existence of a superior and the supreme authority that we call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is coherence, there is harmony and there is balance in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran again introduces itself as a book that is for the guidance of humanity. And that is uh, promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be protected by him and will uh, dwell in, in detail when we uh, come to a specific part of this just. Allah is fully aware of everything that is happening in this universe. He is the creator of all. He is not just the creator of Muslims or non-Muslims or Arabs or Asians. He is the creator of all. And the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says begins from a very humble beginning. But uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored human being and uh, given them the, the universe to explore and to develop and to progress further. He gave that much honor to human beings that he asked the Malaika to bow before the human beings. In other words, to acknowledge and accept the human potential based on their intellect and based on their rationalization. And those who opposed human beings, those who challenged that human uh, intellect, were described as the ones who were shaitan, shaitan, who were so arrogant that they used their background or their status as a symbol of their high positions and look down upon others. And 
the those evil forces vowed to mislead human beings and to fill their hearts and their minds with the, their way of thinking but those who believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never succumb to the desires and to the design of the shayati. Quran in this juz Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also refers to Surah Al-Fatiha and says that how uh, powerful that uh, surah is that summarizes the entire message of the Quran and that summarizes the human relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance to human being. That uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells in this <clears throat> surah that those who are righteous will always receive the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will be rewarded in those who are wicked and who are selfish and who are in a state of denial would suffer the consequences of their action. It also <clears throat> reminds people that the prophets are chosen from amongst human beings. They have a strength of character and it is the strength of the character that uh, becomes the foundation of uh, their being selected as the messenger. And uh, <clears throat> it says that those messengers do not uh, give any message other than the one that they have been entrusted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran also opposes the shirk, polytheism, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or human beings becoming their own gods. It also <clears throat> challenges that notion of Arabs at that particular time who used to call angels as daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran points out that while they themselves bury their own daughters, yet they call angels the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says that people, as long as they are, you know, believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have an opportunity to repent for what uh, wrong they have done. And if they repent, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept that. The bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are limitless. Human beings cannot even imagine the voluminous bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them. And it also says that justice, benevolence, care of the kith and kin, they are the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are part and essence of the faith itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids shameful deeds and then aggression and attacks and evil doings. And then that the very clearly Quran says that it is unchangeable because it is based on truth and it is based on a divine guidance until the eternity. And it says that when you approach non-Muslims, when you de give dawah to others, use the strategy that Ibrahim والسلام, applied and follow his sunnah in that particular respect, in addition to Prophet So this in general is the overview of this particular uh, just which comprises Surah Al-Hijr and part of Surah Al-Nahat. Let us focus on five or six major issues that uh, needs to be explained in greater detail. The first one is uh, Verse four, four of the Surah Al-Hijr. And it says, وَمَا أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَرِيَةٍ إِلَّا وَلَهَا كِتَابٌ مَعْلُوْمٌ That the people of uh, any town or any, or any civilization was not destroyed, except that they created the seed of their destruction through their own hands. In other 
first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding people that if they are not careful in terms of organizing their individual and collective life based on the principles that he has mentioned, justice, benevolence, taking care of others, and, and, and uh, proper exploration and running, uh, doing away with superstitions, then that civilization bows or sows the seeds of its own destruction. And anyone who is a student of human civilization and anyone who has studied history would know that every civilization has caused its own destruction because of its own deficiencies or its own lack of understanding of the divine guidance and lack of negligence on its part of the divine guidance and divine messages. One of the key elements that you would find in the destruction of all human civilizations, whether they were by run by Muslims or by non-Muslims, and when I say Muslims, I don't mean Islamic uh, uh, based, Islam based uh, civilization. Muslim means that they uh, Muslim ethnocentric based uh, uh, civilizations, they caused their own destruction by ignoring justice, by ignoring those uh, actions and that in, uh, lead human being to progress and to development. In other words, the Quran is also reminding that uh, societies do not stay stagnant. Human actions bring consequences. And if human beings are not careful about their own actions and their own behavior, they hurt themselves. And then those hurt, hurting either eliminates them or makes them totally irrelevant to the society as a whole. The second one is also a very powerful verse of the Quran, and this is verse 9 of the same surah. And it is a verse that you would not find equivalent of it in any other religious scriptures. And it points out to certain history as well as the human tendency to distort and twist and manipulate the divine guidance. As we know that Quran is the only book that was compiled, approved, formalized in the lifetime of the one who was claiming that he was receiving it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through angel gave. And that is the Quran. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensured that the one who had received it also becomes the guardian of this particular message by ensuring that it is preserved in his lifetime so that no one in the future could point fingers and say that, uh, well, it was complete compiled after his lifetime and he did not supervise it. In fact, there are certain traditions within the Muslim community itself which says that it was compiled in the lifetime of Abu Bakr or it was compiled in the lifetime of Usman. Well, the reality is that the responsibility of uh, compiling the Quran and presenting it the way we have it today was that of the Prophet Wasallam? It was not the responsibility of any other human being because he is the only one who knew what is Quran and what is not Quran. And unless he says it is the Quran, there is no one else who can say that it is not or it is. So the idea that a six-man commission was established, the idea that it was compiled some 12 or 18 years after the departure of the Prophet وسلم, does not make sense in the context of this Quranic verse. 
And it also points out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want his final message to be twisted, to be changed, to be manipulated by the clergy or by those who claim that they are the scholars of the Quran or they are the ones who have the truth and understand. By preserving the Quran in the way we have and by ensuring that nothing in the Quran changes what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is not the monopoly of the scholars, this is not the monopoly of those people who claim that they are knowledgeable, this is in the domain of human beings. It is in fact the democratization of religion itself, where each and every individual is invited to relate to the Quran and understand the Quran and live the Quran. Regardless of their gender and regardless of their ethnicity and regardless of their thing. And this is something that we find lacking within the Muslim community itself, where the people are being told that they cannot understand the Quran because it is the domain of the scholars. No, it is not. The one who revealed it has protected it, has preserved it, preserved it not for a certain section of people, but for all humanity so that humanity could learn and could make use of that particular Quran. And it also gives us the historical reference that almost all the religious elites of the previous faiths that were revealed by God Almighty, changes were made to suit the interests of those who were powerful, those who, were, who had the resources, and those who wanted to manipulate things for their own gains. And this is a stop that Allah wanted to put on that. Yes, people can have an interpretation and can have understanding and differences in understanding, but the original text will always remain the same. In fact, uh, I need not to bring that one up, but uh, it, in this context, uh, there are two things that need to be mentioned. In 1942, a German institute collected some 42,000 copies of the Quran from all over the world. That was 1942. To look at the discrepancies or look at the divisions or the differences within the text itself, and they did not find a single letter which was different than the remaining ones. Not a single copy of the Quran had anything different than the other copy of the Quran. It was all the same. On the contrary, what is very interesting that there is a society called the Bible Society, which meets every year, which is the Bible Scholar Society, which meets every year in California. Uh, and uh, they review the Bible. They expunge the lines and the verses of the Bible, and they add whatever they feel it is. So it is in reference to that. And the same goes with many other religious texts as well. You can change whatever you want to change with the Quran would is and would remain in the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence. The next one is uh, verse 27. This is in reference to the process of evolution of Adam. As we would see that the Quran also mentions that process of evolution. You know, the shaitan was having an argument with Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he's being asked to prostrate, he said, but why should I prostrate? And in that response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that it was uh, uh, a dark clay that um, created uh, the, the 
the structure of human being and then one of it and then the the energy or the spirit was flown into that uh, structure or that uh, physical being in other words it was in evolution it was evolutionary process it was not something that kun fayakun it was uh, even though allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is powerful to do whatever he wants to do but he is explaining that it happened in the stages at first the, you know from nowhere it came and then it was given a life it was given an energy it was given the intellect it was given all those faculties it, it happened and, and as we see also uh, you know uh, from the time of conception until the time of birth there is an evolution of of of, of uh, fetus into a he, he full-fledged human being in the form of, of an infant so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while talking about the creation he's saying well that before this creation that evolved in the form of adam salam, or what we call human beings there was another creation that creation had a fiery nature now it's a matter of interpretation there are people who would say that they were created in fire we don't know how the fire creates fire burns but maybe these are ambaul right these are the matters of, uh, of uh, un incomprehensible issues which may or may discover later on but um, right now we do not think that the fire uh, creates but the ashes or but uh, the smoke and uh, it might have its own purpose and it would someday human beings would definitely develop that kind of understanding but, but fire uh, becomes a source for creating so many things so, so uh, even, even now when we are at the infancy of knowledge we, we still learn that. so it is in reference to those those people who had this fiery nature those people who were created the other interpretation who were created from the fire uh, they existed min qabla now, are they still in existence? The Quran says that, yes, but they are invisible. In what form they are, in what shape they are, they, they are there. But uh, can people see them? The Quran and does not give any indication that they can be seen. The Quran does not give any indication that they can interfere in human life. The Quran does not give indication that they can do any good or any hurtful thing to human beings. And that is uh, where we would leave this particular ayah. Uh, in other words, the, the, the human beings were not the only creation. There were creations before human beings also. Uh, and uh, and also, let's go to verse ninety-seven to ninety-nine. Now, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is describing the condition of the people, Muslim early earlier Muslims, when they were facing opposition and when they were having rejections from the others. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling them how to deal with that situation. It is saying how did they. they they dealt with it, and, uh, and and conversely, it is also telling us this is how we, when faced with challenges, with faced with rejection, with faced with Islamophobic uh, attitude of the people, how should we deal with them? Whatever they say is hurtful. We know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is addressing the Prophet and his companion. We know. It is hurtful. And it is hurtful when we see people making statements against Islam, people making statements against Muslims, people are pointing fingers at every verse of the Quran and projecting and presenting it in a manner that uh, does not make any sense to them or to others. It hurts. It hurts when Islam is attacked from all corners. It hurts when Muslims are attacked. It hurts when uh, things that one cannot even imagine are, are, are being told and are being done against Muslims. It is hurtful. But how should we deal with that situation? 
and the Quran says, فَصَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَقُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ Now again, it's a matter of interpretation. Again, it's a matter of looking at it in a passive sense or in an active sense. One way, which many people have adopted throughout history is for sabbih bihamdi rabbika, go sit down in the mosque, start reciting the tasbih, min sajideen, and keep, keep on doing the sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not what the Quran intends. This is not what the Quran says. For sabbih bihamdi rabbika. And when you are faced with challenges, Double down on your efforts to face those challenges. Or sabbeh behamdi rabbi. Sabbeh means to perform the task to its excellence and take the it to the logical end. Wa kum mina sajideen, and then follow the guidance and follow the rules and follow the balance in your action. Sajideen means that you accept how you would be and you follow those norms for some behind rabbika so whatever your lord your creator has told you to deal with that kind of situation that is you show patience you study the issues that are being brought up you respond to those issues you engage them in only those people who are not someone bookman omyun, who are not blind, who are not uh, uh, deaf, who are have not rejected completely, you ex you, ex you explain things to them. and keep on following the divine guidance in your life. Do not uh, be those who are aggressors. Do not do things that would defeat the very purpose of what you're saying. And in that respect, the Quran is implying that the response is not that you kill other person or you commit an act of violence against us. Because if you kill and you commit the violence, it's your defeat. You have admitted that you are unable to convince the other person. You have admitted that you are unable to uh, change their perspectives and mind based on logic, based on rationality, based on the truth. Use using coercion to deprive them of of, of uh, their uh, ability to change themselves. So this is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. For sabbih bihamd rabbika wa kum min sajidin. Can we go to the next one? Also, I'm the same uh, in that one. It says uh, also, yeah, wa'bud rabbaka hatta yatiyat yakin. And then keep following the divine guidance until you meet your Lord, until you meet your fate. So in other words, it's a lifelong struggle. It is not something that you would give up. It is not something that you should uh, you know, think of, of abandoning. And it is in this particular uh, represent that we also bring to another ayah, which is not here, but which says that woman yaqnutu min rahmatil rabbihi there are only those who have no confidence and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are lost. Uh, they are the one who uh, basically uh, lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's laws, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. So this is where we, 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 we stand in terms of our understanding of, 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 of the Quran. That uh, it is the, and this is not a statement of arrogance, this is a statement of responsibility that historically is no other uh, uh, divinely revealed book that was compiled in the lifetime of the person who received it. This book is for all. And then in the propagation of the ideas and the ideals, people uh, will face opposition. They have to double down on their efforts to change the perspectives of people on Islam and, and divine God Almighty. And lastly, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that uh, um, uh, 
we should tell them the truth. What we need to focus on is the concept of God as explained to us in the Quran, because that is the key. That is the key. A rest will come from that. Once we have that, and um, we have that understanding, then uh, people will be able. Because most of the people believe in the existence of God. Ninety-five percent of the world population believes in the existence of God, but in different ways and different manners. And this is where uh, we have a special responsibility to show that that concept that we believe is shared in a manner. It makes sense to other people. Aku dah kau ni haza, was tak pro wahyu, walak. Thank you, Dr. Aslam. So, um, some verses um, I have that uh, I wanted to see if you could reflect on further. Um, this uh, one verse, which is Surah 15, Al Hijr, Ayah 18. Uh, it says any eavesdropper will be pers- pursued by a clearly visible flame uh, this is in the context of um, uh, you know it says that the jinn used to go into the heavens and uh, and an eavesdrop on the future and then they would come back and create havoc so allah taala allah subhanahu wa taala stop that Uh, that uh, that avenue for them. So, how do we understand this verse? Do you think? Well, it is very interesting that that verse comes after verse uh, nine, which says, "Inna nahnu nazzal nazikra wa inna lahu lhafizun." That we are the one who have revealed it, and we are the one who are protecting. So, Quran is making a very definite statement that no one would be able to change. no one would be able to contaminate it no one would be able to uh, you know erase it having said that the quran is saying that there are people who try would try to twist the quran who would try to uh, give people different uh, perspectives on the quran or would give doubts in the minds of the people about the divine origin of that revelation so this verse is allegorical verse and it's saying that those who would do it would create a kind of flame for themselves in the sense that they would uh, not be able to convince other that one thing and secondly they would shahab mubin means usually you would translate it as meteor or a star Uh, in the sense in other words what is saying that uh, their argument their perspectives their lies about the quran would be clarified in in the same manner as uh, the darkness in the night is clarified by the stars and by the moon it is in this particular context this is be allah is capable of doing anything but what what have we have to do is to look it in the context of what is uh, what was said earlier inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun we would protect so he has protected it now if anyone is trying to twist and change and manipulate it then he would be dealt in a manner that all his arguments and all the darkness that he says is is removed okay so that is a uh, that is a perspective that we should it. definitely Yeah, definitely. That we should look at. And, and, and I'm not saying that there are no other perspectives. There are, there are several other perspectives, but this one makes sense to me in the context of what the, the Quranic verse is. Right, and there's another verse in the end. I think uh, that I wanted to uh, bring up, okay. and it goes along the same lines. I think as what you just mentioned. So uh, the next verse is. Uh, um, And this is a new verse that I have uh, uh, realized. Fifteen uh, twenty-two. We send the we send the winds to fertilize, and we bring down water from the sky for you to drink. You do not control its sources. So um, in the fourteenth century, it's talking about the role of winds in fertilization, 
And this fertilization process, as far as I know, and if there are any other botanists or scientists out there, they may be able to reflect. But as far as I know, this is a fairly recent 19th century uh, uh, analysis of how fertilization takes place. So do you have any perspective on this? Dr. Aslam, you are currently muted. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Okay. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular verse is describing the physical laws. The water, how it evaporates and how it comes down. The winds what kind of impact it has. And this is a process that has been going on for millions of years. The water is coming down, the, the winds are there, the earth is growing. We are discovering it in stages. We are discovering, discovering it on the basis of our limited knowledge and our limited understanding. So until the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th century, it was not known to the people that uh, wind uh, also produces uh, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the growth uh, of plants and other things. But now people do. The same way as we yesterday uh, found one particular verse pertaining to uh, the Fir'aun, that uh, the Qur'an used the word, today we will save your body, and the scholars, even the Qur'anic scholars, uh, try to interpret it that it meant the armors, or the armor, or the, or the, the, the body attire that uh, Fir'aun was wearing at the time. But when the body discovered, then their understanding changed, so there are so many other facts, and the scientists tell us that we have not yet understood more than 3% of our universe. So there are 97% more to be studied and to be explored, and the coming centuries would be very exciting as we would discover many of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our problem is that uh, when people say that we have nothing to do with the science, we have nothing to do with this exploration, we should only go and sit down in the mosque and subbeh beham the rabbi ka wastaghfir or keep on reciting the tasbih and keep... No, this is not what the Quran is asking. Quran is asking to follow the divine guidance in every aspect of life and do excellent thing in terms of exploring and understanding. Why should we explore and understand? First of all, to know the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know. We see what is apparent, but there is something more than that. And then secondly, make use of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for humanity as a whole. How many of us knew 60 years ago that uh, the sand would create the, the chips that would now be used in, in, in the information technology? We did not know. But now we know. It has been there for centuries, for, for millenniums. So this is what the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So what he's saying that do not isolate the development from the divine creation. See that as, a, as part of the divine scheme and divine creation. And that is the beauty of the Quran, that it does not only focus on the spiritual development of human being, it links the spiritual development it links the religious and theological understanding with the scientific understanding, with the understanding of the physical laws and the universal laws. Right. So, and I guess it is human nature, you know, across religions and uh, different communities uh, where people fall back on religion and deny science. And we can see that happening these days 
in, in other faiths also. True, I mean, it is, it is, no doubt about it. Yeah. So um, uh, then the next... I think verse, there is some truncated voice and it seems that... Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, so uh, yes, go this ahead. Is, uh, this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is leading to us, is that the faith is not something that can be attained only in the place of worship. The entire universe is the playground. The entire universe needs to be understood and came within the context of the divine majesty and divine guidance. And one must make use of uh, that thing. I see another word coming on, yeah, on this so screen. This is, yeah, so this is uh, verse 47 of Surah Hijr. And uh, this relates to our uh, relationships in this world. So um, uh, I was asking to see if uh, you would uh, reflect on this one also. We shall remove any bitterness from their hearts. They will be like brothers sitting on couches face to face. Well, the Quran is giving again the allegorical reference to the world that has yet to come. There, that it is possible that the human beings will have a situation where they will live without conflicts, without any kind of jealousy, without any kind of hostility towards any animosity towards against each other. Quran is projecting the future, and Quran is inviting human beings to see if they can start working on that future in this life because when the Quran is talking about things, it is not only referring to the life here. After only it is a referring to life here. After, in the context of this world, Quran is not saying that you do away with this life and you abandon this life and focus on the life here after. Because if this is the case, then the entire idea of exploration, the entire idea that everything needs to be understood, every physical laws need to be understood, becomes meaningless. So the Quran is saying that a time would come when human being would reach to that level of humanity and that level of spirituality where they would, you know, forego all those tendencies that lead to animosity, that lead to jealousy, that lead to hatred, that lead to revenge and all those things, where people are uh, sitting as equal, where people are enjoying each other's company, where people are not afraid of each other, people are that in, in the true sense, uh, you know, the, the, the servants of God. And the Quran, by giving that allegorical reference to the future, is telling people that it is possible that you can create that kind of word if you follow the divine guidance, because the life hereafter would be you know, given to those in that sense who follow the divine guidance. So what Allah is saying that you know, in this world also you can create that kind of situation. So it is very powerful sense and very reassuring that uh, whatever good we will do in this world will also lead to good in the life hereafter. And our life is not just a physical existence for a short period of time, but it is a continued, a continuous process of existence that ultimately would lead to an ideal situation in an ideal condition where we will uh, live a life uh, fully satisfied with ourselves and fully satisfied with uh, each other and, and live in harmony and peace. Yeah, so an excellent verse to reflect on uh, that uplifts us and gives us hope for the future. Um, indeed, indeed. So the, the last verse uh, um, is... Uh, Surah 1590, uh, yes. like the warning we have sent down to those who divided, who divided themselves, who divide themselves into bands and 91 mm -hmm. uh, and abuse the Quran. So in one, in, yes. in, 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 uh, in flowing uh, text, it is uh, like the warning we have sent down for those who divide themselves into bands and abuse the Quran. So who are the people who are abusing the Quran and who are the people who are dividing themselves into bands? Well, primarily it refers to 
Muslims. Even though some people might say that it refers to Christians and Jews, but they don't believe, they didn't believe in the Quran. They believed in their own books. They rejected the Quran. So the Muslims who believed in the Quran. But what happened is that they divided themselves. And even at the time of the Prophet وسلم, they had different understandings, and diff even though he was present. There. And, uh, you know, it, they, rather than reflecting on the Quranic uh, message and the Quranic guidance, they focused more on their tribal uh, way of life. They focused more on their own sectarian understanding based on their ethnic uh, relationship, based on their previous understanding of a lot of things. So the Quran is not only reflecting on its time, on the time in which it is being revealed, but also reflecting on the future also, that uh, don't be like those people who would divide this Quran, don't be like those people who would make it uh, um, totally um, abandoned or meaningless or, 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 or useless. So it is in, 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 in that particular context. Again, as, as, as we, we know that uh, Quran talks in allegorical sense, Quran talks in, in, in a, somewhere in general sense, sometime in specific and particular sense here it is talking, warning, and it is also uh, giving a empirical thing that uh, uh, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were often misused uh, by, by, by the people uh, in the past. And, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that the people in the future or people in the present will not misuse. Right. So that's an excellent uh, verse to end our session on uh, and invite everyone to uh, understand the Quran and make sure we come up with a common understanding of the Quran. Uh, and if there are differences, of course, I mean, uh, we look at that uh, in respect uh, to, uh, uh, to one another and uh, with sincerity, you know, but we'll still be united in making sure that we do not abuse need, need the Quran, inshallah. So thank you so much, Dr. Aslam. And uh, indeed, I think that is what whole month is leading us. To, that we thank you very much, and uh, let's recite to the last. Well, as in the insan al fiqus, illa ladina amun wa amil salihat wa tuwasu bil haq wa tuwasu bil sifr. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless us and bless everyone who is part of this discussion. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala have you mercy upon each one of us. Subhanahu wa Taala karabil isti amma yisifun. Wassalamu ala al-musallim. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And see you tomorrow. Inshallah.